One evening, some time ago, I received an email from my friend Gerard Sagmiller. My wife and I knew that he and his wife Sherry were expecting to have a baby any time, so their email read something like this. Dear friends, we are proud to announce the birth of our son, Dakota Sagmiller. He was born at 4 a.m. He weighs 6 pounds and 13 ounces. Sherry is doing fine. However, there have been some complications with Dakota. We have also been informed that he may have Down syndrome. This is difficult news to hear, but there is still some testing that must be done. Please keep us in your thoughts and prayers. Like any friend, I was both happy and concerned. So I prayed for strength for the Sagmillers. I prayed for comfort, and I prayed the test would come out negative. It did not. About a year after the birth of Dakota, I received a call from Gerard. It was obvious that over time he had come to terms with the fact that Dakota had Down syndrome. However, I still sensed that Gerard had not come to terms with Down syndrome itself. What did the future hold for Dakota? Will he ever drive or go to college? Could he marry or have children? And most importantly, could he be happy? How would this impact their daughter, Savannah? And would anything be normal again? I eventually found out that these were questions people in his situation would ask, but seldom out loud. So this was our quest, one father on a search for the truth about Down syndrome. So Gerard dived into the world of Down syndrome, asking tough questions from the experts in the field, from a Harvard professor to a pastor, from clinical specialists to families who are confronted with Down syndrome every day. But first, I asked Sherry and Gerard to share their initial reaction to having a child with Down syndrome. When we first went for the test, the, uh, the first test came back negative. That would be the sonogram? Yeah. We had a level two sonogram because I was over 35 years old. And at the sonogram time, I remember actually, after the fact, I remember walking out of the doctor's office and the doctor said, we don't see any markers for Down syndrome. And that was the last thought I had of Down syndrome. And uh, they had the doctor on staff deliver him via C-section. And they were doing all the prep work that they do with him and they brought him over. And a nurse followed us over and, and into the room and you could kind of see something was on her mind. And she said, oh, I believe your, your son has Down syndrome. And she says, you know, there's further tests that they can do and they'll let us know. Um, I said, well, what's your accuracy rate in guessing? And she said, I think 99.5%. At that point, we just wanted any hope that he didn't have Down syndrome because, you know, you want your baby to be healthy and perfect. And we just wanted to hang on to that 1% chance that he didn't have Down syndrome. So Sherry's old neighbor that was uh, still a friend to ours. She likes to be called my previous neighbor or my former neighbor. She doesn't like to be called old because <laughs> I always call her my old neighbor and she corrects me. Okay. <laughs> Sherry's previous neighbor, a friend of ours, um, had a friend that had a son with Down syndrome born and they went out and adopted a girl with Down syndrome. And she came to the hospital to visit us with her little daughter which blew a lot of our first impressions away of somebody that might have Down syndrome. She was very polite. She was a beautiful little girl. She was well-mannered. She talked to her mom and just, and almost made her head swirl. Then I knew in my mind that, you know, my perceptions and understanding was not even close to understanding really what the possibilities were. Well, I think it's important to preface it by saying I'm 13 years out from the day that the 
doctor came in and said, we think your child has Down syndrome. And so it was a process. We went to um, through the fear, um, which led to education, which led to empowerment, which led to embracing the situation, and now full-fledged ad advocacy. And we had a 13, we have now a 13-year-old with Down syndrome, and an opportunity presented itself um, later on for us to expand our family from four to five and hence our adoption of Grace Walene. And we always say that um, when the adoption agency, which was owned by a friend of ours, called and said, we've got this child, she's beautiful, she's from a different culture, and um, she uh, has Down syndrome. We said, Korean, don't care what color she is. The fact that she has Down syndrome we knew was doable, but the fact that she was a girl after having four boys was a blessing. Right now, it is the number one requested special needs is a child with Down syndrome. In fact, um, I don't know if you got the email about the child that was available in New Orleans, and I called to make sure that um, that the child was going to be adopted, and she said from day one that that email went out, they had over 70 hits on their website for the baby, and they had to narrow it down to 30. And the mom and dad that were choosing to put the baby up for adoption um, were thrilled that they could not believe that anyone would request this specific diagnosis. I enjoy my typical children, those that are gifted, those that are average, and my children that have Down syndrome for their individuality, and we, and it makes for a blended family. After interviewing Melissa, Gerard noted one of his favorite sayings by Bishop Desmond Tutu. You don't choose your family. They are God's gift to you as you are to them. So after Dakota came home, um, we started looking into the different services and things like that, and um, we actually found a couple of op options available to us. And then we also found the Leanne Britton Center, um, which is the Infant Development Center over at Shawnee Mission Hospital. We started, the Leanne Britton Infant Development Center started as the Infant Development Center in 1972. and. It really began, well, it really began as a dream a lot earlier than that. Leanne um, uh, graduated with a degree in speech and audiology, and this is during the 50s. And her dream was to work with children uh, who had special needs. Her first job out of high school was to go back east, and she worked in a state institution. And what she found were children with special needs, children with Down syndrome who were in beds, um, strapped to their beds, on Thorazine. They were basically warehoused. Very, you know, someone would come around and feed them and change them, and it was just a waiting period until the children passed away. And she lasted about a week at that job, but she just kept thinking, you know, if you could involve parents, if you had high expectations, if children could be part of a community, there would be no limits on what, you know, what you could have. And that's exactly what she did. She came back to Kansas City, started with nine families. They met in the basement of a church and they would come and all the moms would come and bring their children. They would work together with their children and it was exactly what she expected. The kids did great things. After the detection of Down syndrome, in many cases, additional learning challenges are not diagnosed or even tested for. The learning challenge may not be so much Down syndrome as it is other disabilities that go undetected, like autisms. Fumming through the local newspaper, and there's an article in there about Two individuals that have Down syndrome, they got married to each other, Derek and Nicole. And that just intrigued me because um, in your mind a lot of times you set limitations or people will make comments like, well, I guess you don't have to plan for a wedding. or uh, You expect your children to live with you for the rest of your life sometimes if they have a special need. You don't yes. expect them to be that independent to get out on their own. So. And it's not really fair to them, so anytime you see this, it's, it was great. So we needed to listen to him speak. They were going to speak at a local guild, and we went and listened. You know, on a, on a functionality basis, I don't want to judge, to be blunt, but as a love that they have for each other, it's unbelievable what they have. Most people would be so jealous of it and will never reach that level in their lives. I think it's a pure love. Yeah. You can only hope that for any of your children, not yes. just your children with special needs. Though. That's true. That's absolutely right. This is Derek and this is Nicole, and That's they're right. a married couple, aren't you? Yep. And they, the way they met, they uh, 
they knew each other from Votech School in Olathe, where they both right. went to uh, hospitality class, which they learned how to do hotel work and restaurant work. And yep. Nicole asked Derek to go to her junior prom. And they went to their her prom together, and they went to his prom together, and they went to her prom together, and they went to his prom together. But the very first date they went on, we went and picked Derek up <laughs> at the dance. And he got in the van, and he said, I love her. I'm going to marry her. And that's all we heard for the last seven years after that was, I'm going to marry her. <laughs> so finally, isn't that right? Yeah. Yeah. So finally, they we decided that they were really serious about it. I mean, they really are very in love. It, even after a, a year and a half of being married, they're still that way. Everyone has a story to tell or a little lesson to teach in life. Gerard noted later that we all have a disability, even if it's not understanding what a disability is in the first place. And maybe that is why so many people are uncomfortable with those who have Down syndrome or autism or another disability. It reminds us that we are not perfect, and no one will ever be. Not too long after Dakota was born, um, one of my close friends gave me the book, um, Common Threads, Celebrating Life with Down Syndrome. And it's really a neat book. Through that, there was also an article in the Wall Street Journal. Then we were, Gerard and I were talking about this article, and I was like, that's the same guy that's name is on the book that we have. And also, uh, Brian's mentor, um, Dr. Crocker was one of the leading authorities in the nation on Down syndrome and I had the chance to talk to both of them, was, which was just unbelievable. What are some of the facts, like how many are born a year and that information? We know that about one out of every 800 to 1,000 people have Down syndrome giving us about 5,000 people with Down syndrome born every year and a rough estimate of about 350,000 families here in the United States who have someone with Down syndrome. Down syndrome remains the most common chromosomal condition that we have and people with Down syndrome continue to teach us as they did years ago that they are important and valuable contributors to our society. Mothers who are older do have a, a proclivity uh, for uh, for delivery of a child with Down syndrome, but other than that, uh, personal circumstances, environment, diet, all the rest of it are uh, remarkably independent. Now with that statistic, more children with Down syndrome are born to younger mothers, but that is because more younger women are having children. I later discovered that Gerard was actually relieved by what he learned at our Harvard visit. For instance, why did people with Down syndrome talk in a mumbled manner? It's because they have enlarged tongues, which makes it difficult to talk. And their mumbled speech has nothing to do with their abilities. In fact, many of the youngsters have trouble keeping their larger tongues in their mouth. Another individual that um, we've met through our son having Down syndrome is um, Lee Jones. And I guess one of the reasons that I really wanted to meet Lee was um, you talk to people and people start to know, you know, similar names come up in conversation. And one of the comments that was made to me one day was, well, not everybody could be a Lee Jones. You know, you all want your children to be a Lee Jones, but they can't all be a Lee Jones. And so after that, I was on this driven mission to find out who Lee Jones was because not everybody can be Lee Jones. I need to know who Lee Jones is and what he's doing. And I thought that was the best about when I heard him talk is he can motivate anyone. Yes. Um, and I think you even said after it was over that, People went to, the, to, to hear him speak, and they actually said he's done more in his life by setting goals and achieving them than I have. One of the greatest hurdles a person with disabilities faces is that many professionals have their own ideas about what would be good goals. It is not that these professionals mean to do well your dreams. It is just that they don't want you to get disappointed if the dreams are not achieved. They will use words like reasonable or realistic expectations. Unfortunately, if these suggestions are accepted, the person never gets a chance to pursue their dream. It's like playing baseball, but never getting a chance to bat. Let me give you a few examples. 
of some reasonable expectations that were given to me. He may learn to tie his shoes, but he will never be able to cross the street. <laughs> well, thank goodness we didn't accept my daughter's predictions of the future. This is what the experts reasonable expectations were. He might be reading above where they were now, but he will plateau soon and eventually go down. He should go into a self-contained trainable classroom. I wasn't even in the first grade yet, and they were deciding my future. Fortunately, we didn't accept the advice. I took driver's education and learned all the basics for driving a car. I passed my written test on the first time, but my instructor wouldn't give me my learning permit. He thought that someone with Down syndrome should not drive. My parents and school principal helped him to change his mind. <laughs> One day after school, I went to the driver license bureau to take the written and the driving tests. I passed both tests on the first try. If you have a driver's license, you need your own wheels. <laughs> One of my most exciting milestones was buying my first new car. I applied to three colleges, one in Arkansas, one in Iowa, and a, a community college in the Kansas City area. Now, when it had the best support was in Arkansas, but the director of the Special Support Center turned me down and said that based on her professional opinion, I was not capable of doing college level work. Another reasonable expectation. In college, I was a part of the Orion House. That's where I lived. I was the only house counselor. I was the treasurer for the hall and took care of all the house funds. It took me four and one half years to finish and was one of my proudest accomplishments. Sherry and Gerard learned more about life from the speech that Lee wrote and spoke that night. The thought that, do what's right in your heart, though you may be criticized anyway. It all rang so true. And that's the great thing about Down syndrome is there's this support group around you that's just huge. And Gerard and I are really impressed with the fact that we have met a lot of great people that um, we wouldn't have met if we didn't have this child with Down syndrome. And I know Gerard called me one day from work and said that um, there's a lady in the newsletter at work and she had a daughter with Down syndrome. And um, they'd, they'd written up an article about Rachel and I'll let you tell that. Yeah, her name was Rachel O'Brien. She had gone to the World Olympics for Special Olympics and she had pl taken seven silver medals in swimming. These are all the big dogs Those are all the, the, medals. the big medals that I got from Ireland. From Ireland, from the World Games. World Games. World Games. Wow. She did an 800 meter freestyle. She was the only USA athlete to swim it. Yes. She did a 400 meter freestyle. She did a 200 meter freestyle and she helped in a 4x50 relay race. Wow. Congratulations. And she got silver in everything she did. So we wow. dubbed her the Silver Queen. There you wow. go. Otherwise known as Flounder because that was her nickname for Ireland. Oh, Flounder. Yeah. They dubbed her Flounder. The mm. only Flounder knows how to swim. Oh, <laughs> okay. This Rachel was an outstanding individual. She was another one a pleasure to meet. And I think what shocked me the most about Rachel was her dry sense of humor. It almost knocked me off my feet because she's kind of quiet and reserved and very proper and sits there. And then she'll just come out with a one-line zing that almost, you know, just cuts you up. In a way, it's almost like monkey see, monkey do. If you give them the right if they see, then they, they do. <laughs> Show them the right way and they follow. Am I a monkey? So you can hang on the monkey bars like a monkey. There's been times when I've wondered. Maybe a little bit. After meeting with Rachel, Gerard noted, 
I can't stop people talking about my child's limitations, but I can stop listening to them and believe in Dakota, just like Rachel's mom did toward her. If my child is unable to do some function at the end of the day, he is not any less of a person. If anything, he is more of a person for trying, when many would not, even though they can. We were getting a lot of comments from people, like, I guess your son has a free ticket into heaven, but I wanted to talk to our pastor, Pastor Adams, about that. You know, when you read the scriptures, there's a story in John chapter nine, uh, John chapter nine, in which uh, the disciples and Jesus are walking along, and they find a man who was born blind. And the disciples ask a question that was commonplace for that day. They asked, "Did this man sin, or did his parents sin, that he was born blind?" So the assumption was that if you were born with a disability, somebody sinned. And, and it was believed at that time by the rabbis that one could sin within the womb. So perhaps this child sinned in the womb or his parents had sinned that he was born blind. And Jesus gives this wonderful response. He said, it was neither this man nor his parents that sinned, but this happened, this man was born blind that the glory of God might be revealed. And I look at these children who are born with disabilities and I don't think it was a factor of God was punishing somebody, God was disappointed in somebody. I think God looks at these children differently than we do. And when he looks at them, they are opportunities for his glory to be revealed. And when we see children, when I see children with Down syndrome, there is a part of the glory of God I see in each of them that makes me more human. It calls forth from me. It makes me stop and it makes me think about what it means to be human and they show us that. And, and, and so, and I think the longer a parent lives into what was disappointment and pain and grief, but then they, then they, they watch this child grow up and they love this child and they begin to see this, they see in this child the glory of God, their perspective begins to change. And I've ministered with many parents um, in our Matthews ministry who, uh, who have talked about this, how hard it was when they first had the child and then years later how they would not change it for anything, how grateful they were that they had this child. But when it comes to a child who's born with Downs, the question is, the question is what does it mean to be whole? And if there are physical limitations, the, the Bible tells us we'll have a heavenly body that will be different than the earthly body and it will not be bound in the same way as our earthly body is. Uh, I don't think it's impossible that a child with Downs might get to heaven and then they would be quote normal, but I'm not really sure what normal is and I'm not certain that, that for many of these children, their normal is more normal than many of us who consider ourselves whole. Gerard also wanted to know how other cultures viewed someone with Down syndrome. He had read that some Native American tribes believed that people born with special needs were actually gifts or works of the Creator. A Native American expert confirmed what Gerard had read and added that people with special needs were treated with respect in their own tribes. Well, talking to these parents, I guess when Dakota is old enough and moves out on his own, I wanted to see what other possibilities were out there and what other people were doing. And we ran into the best group, and they are individuals with uh, Down syndrome that perform and do dance and songs. And it was quite interesting to watch them. We went to their Christmas party, actually. And I cried. Yeah, every song was a tearjerker. I'm Marlene Wagman, and I started the Best Network program. It's Beyond the Evening Star Theater, where every star shines bright. Our message is that we're trying to create communities of kindness and inclusion, beginning with ourselves. Um, our experience has been raising a child with um, disabilities is that it's not always easy for typical people to understand how to incorporate them. They may have the desire, but they also may have a fear. So we're breaking down the barriers so that those things can happen naturally. Seeing the best group perform was touching, but not as touching as watching their parents smile and tear up with joy as they watched their child soak in one of life's great moments. It was the kind of pride any mom or dad would feel when watching their children put their whole heart and soul into something meaningful not unlike what a parent would feel when a typical child is performing at a public school concert or giving their best at soccer or football. As I watched this group, it was a portrait of each member's world, 
and reminded me that it's not where you end up in life, but what you have done with your abilities and your gifts. My dream is to be a, a professional singer, dancer, a dance teacher, a writer, and acting, and being a lawyer. But my parents could not afford a law school. But I did everything I said for that one. The basic question I asked in the research study was directed at the mothers, and that was, how did you find out your child had Down syndrome, and what did the doctor say, and how well did he or she do it? And what mothers reported, not surprisingly, but nonetheless disappointedly, is that doctors are oftentimes insensitive, if not altogether rude, when it comes to delivering the diagnosis and explaining the possibilities and the realities of living with Down syndrome. Mothers have said over and over again that doctors are good at explaining the medical intricacies of the syndrome. But when it comes to describing the possibilities and the potential, um, they're lagging behind. Our friends from church had their fourth child, and the way that they found out that their daughter had Down syndrome was a nurse who came over and asked her how old she was and did she realize the r risk she put her baby at for having Down syndrome. And that person is still holding on to somehow she caused the Down syndrome. For the very day Derek was born, um, and I like to tell the story, but I'll try and make it short, my initial inkling there was a problem was after being awake 36 hours through birth and finally getting home and laying, laying down in bed and getting a phone call to, to urgently rush back to the hospital. Had no clue what it was, they wouldn't tell me. I had to just go there and find out and I was met at the elevator by our doctor and a priest. I thought, oh, this is not good. And so they took me in a room and sat me down and then broke the news that Derek had Down syndrome, or at least they felt like he did and that they would have to do some tests. And immediately my first question was, he's not dead. Because that's, of course, everything I'd been thinking up to that moment. And, and I think maybe that blinded me to somewhat initially to what we were dealing with because for, and to this day, I feel like, well, you know, he wasn't dead. We can deal with anything else. <laughs> and, and of course, at that point, they also offered the option of, uh, you know, you don't have to take him home with you right now. We can leave him here. We've got some nice places we can institutionalize him. You don't have to worry about this. And that was, you know, I said, are you crazy? Uh, we're, no way. So, uh, and, and again, that was kind of the mentality back then. I don't believe that is today. The study shows that about only half of mothers and fathers, when they have a child with Down syndrome, admit to even knowing anything about Down syndrome. And those who thought they knew something about Down syndrome most say that everything they thought, or most of it, was a misconception. And that within the first year, uh, their special person kind of disproved and demystified all the wrong beliefs that they might have had. They say again and again, it's, it's nowhere I, like I thought it was going to be. It, it's, been a, it's been a joy. I, I just think he thinks it's cool. Our nine-year-old, you know, this is something, of course, they've been raised with. It's not, you know, and we've always had friends who have children with Down syndrome. And I remember saying to Berkeley, who at the time was, I believe, five, um, you know, so-and-so's coming over. You know Danny. Danny, you know, he, he was in your preschool class. He has Down syndrome. And he said, oh, yes. And Ellie, his sister, has Down syndrome. I said, yes. And he said, like, Grant has Down syndrome. I said, yes. And he said, and like, I have Down syndrome. And I said, Berkeley, you don't have Down syndrome. He goes, he was incensed. Well, yes, I do, because if those guys have it, he wants it too, <laughs> you know, kind of a thing. And the siblings in this house will go on to be educators or physicians or therapists. Well, one story that Kristen kind of crystallized for me uh, about uh, getting up and doing the right thing was at the end of high school, she, we went to the Cleveland Playhouse Theater and we were going to go see Grease, which was a musical that was among her favorite. And we were sitting there in the rows, and right before the show started, an uh, uh, actor came out on stage and he said, who wants to come up on stage for a dance party? And I turned to my mother and I said, who in their right mind would get up there in front of the audience? Well, Kristen was gone just like that, of course. She was bolting to the stage. My mother turned to me in a way only a mother could say, Brian, go get your sister. So what am I supposed to do? So I'm pushing people, I'm going down the aisle. By the, by the time I get to the orchestra pit, she's on stage. 
So I have no choice but to get on stage and then escort her off so she doesn't, you know, embarrass the whole family in all of Cleveland, Ohio while we're at it. I get on stage and she's not moving. So now I'm stuck on stage in front of all of Cleveland dancing with Kristen. Uh, and wouldn't you know she won the dance competition. And at the end of the, uh, the day, um, she showed me in a very real way that sometimes opportunities come by in life. And are you going to let them pass by or are you going to get on stage and seize them? And Kristen is someone who has taught me to go for it, to not let your inhibitions keep you in your seat, but to get up and go after it. For new parents, the number one misnomer is that Down syndrome will have a negative impact on brothers and sisters. In fact, all brothers and sisters we talked with viewed it as a blessing or even a gift. This misnomer may account for the estimated 93% early termination rate due to anticipated Down syndrome in a pregnancy. It should also be noted that testing for Down syndrome is still not 100% accurate in the pregnancy itself. And in the beginning when you have a baby with Down syndrome, it seems like it's all about the Down syndrome. As your baby gets a little bit older, you really realize that they're a child and this is a small part of who they are. Uh, you'll have to wait and see as the child proceeds along, just as you do with other children, uh, to see indeed what that individual's characteristics are turning out to be. By the time the child is two or at least three, you have a pretty good idea of what he means to be, uh, and you'll have uh, the parental opportunity to, uh, to do a little bragging. She was invited by the coach. He was an inclusive teacher. And when he saw her medals, he said, come swim for me. It was a small school. He had a, it was a small league. Caused issues with some of the parents because she wasn't competitive. And some of the girls on the team weren't competitive. But he figured that if they wanted to do it and they come to the practices and they put in the effort, they had every right to be on the team. And they chased him away, parents did, with the administrators. By her senior year, he was ready to leave. And at the awards banquet, he said, I have two students on my team that will never win a race. And they're lucky if they're not the last ones out of the pool. But when it comes to going to practice, they're the first ones in the water. They're the last ones out of the water. I never have to tell them what to do. And if all the rest of the girls on my team would put in the effort that Rachel and Mercedes put in, they'd all make it to state. Thank you very much. And he walked away. Can people with Down syndrome drive cars today? Yes. Can people with Down syndrome get married? Yes. Can people with Down syndrome hold jobs, get into the National Sports Hall of Fame, and be an accomplished violinist? Yes. People with Down syndrome are shattering our expectations. But the true magic, I remain convinced, nestles in the small accomplishments that exist every day. If you have a child that doesn't go on to be a concert violinist, he's going to have some other magic, some other treasures that will happen on a day-to-day -day basis. And how lucky are you, the parents, to be able to find those every day? So let's not measure the big accomplishments. The true trophies happen on a day-to-day -day basis. We come to the New Testament, though, and we find story after story of Jesus' ministry with paralytics, Jesus' ministry with those who are physically ill, those who are blind, uh, those who couldn't speak. And, uh, and I love these pictures because Jesus could have just walked on by them. You know, he was a rabbi. He could, have, he could have focused just on teaching. He could have said, all I want to do is preach good sermons. I want to teach. But instead, he seemed to have a heart that when he saw someone who was disabled, he would stop to minister to them. He had compassion upon them and he touched them, even those that were considered unclean by the people of his time, the lepers, you know, who, were, who had a physical illness. Um, but, but in all of these cases, we find Jesus reaching out to touch them, which tells me something about the heart of God. When we look at, when we look at Jesus, Christians believe we see the heart of God. And that tells me that God has a heart for a, a, a compassion, a love for people with special needs. We could have traveled the world to interview the perfect individuals with Down syndrome. And in fact, we were prepared to do so. But part of this story is that we really didn't have to leave our own backyard. It's key to note that Gerard found all the people we interviewed with Down syndrome within a 50 mile radius of his home. You are beginning what will turn out to be 
the greatest adventure of your life, period. Just as much as we don't know the full potential <laughs> or what children without Down syndrome will become, we don't know the full potential of what people with Down syndrome will become. But what we know is true is that people with Down syndrome will succeed the most if their parents, their educators, their priests, and their friends believe in them. And providing all of those opportunities will enhance the possibilities for that child. People come on shapes and sizes. They have different colors of hair and eyes. They have freckles, buffmarks, and other identifying features. These are determined by genetic makeup. I am short, have blonde hair and blue eyes, and Down syndrome. Those are also determined by genetic makeup. It is as natural as any other differences we may have. The doctor, the doctor who discovered this was named Langdon Down. That's where the name came from. It has nothing to do with being down. Interviewing these people and talking to all these people before, they all told us this will be the best thing that will ever happen to you. And you don't get it right after your child's being born that this is going to be the best thing that happens to you. And this will be an angel that will be sent in your life. So we referred to it as an angel. And now that our son's approaching too, we're getting it. We're understanding it. It's a great joy. It's a great experience having them. Is it a lot of work? Yes, it's a lot of work. Is every child a lot of work? Yes. I mean, you know, we went down that path. But I wouldn't trade it for a world because we're definitely not the same person, people that we were before. I think we're closer as, as a couple. Um, and we're definitely closer as a family and has brought people in our family actually closer to us. So we've taken over the local um, lead of the uh, Down syndrome group in our county and uh, we're quite active in it now and trying to get more so as time allows to help people understand these are just beautiful individuals. Everyone, whether they have a disability or not, has the right to have their very own dreams. Just because a person has a disability does not lessen the importance of their dreams. It is not an exaggeration to say that people with Down syndrome are some of the most beautiful people you will ever meet. Both Gerard and this filmmaker actually feel blessed by the experience. You will find very little vanity in the heart of people with Down syndrome and they approach life with both joy and zeal. In fact, if you were to truly judge people by their hearts, they would come out on top almost every time.